at camps and churches and kids crusades and all over the place. And I thought just for a little bit of fun this morning, and we have the kids in here, I would do one trick for you this morning. And actually, Pastor Chris kept asking me to do a magic trick, it, really for him more than any. But the kids are here, so they'll enjoy it. But I'm going to need, <laughs> for the biggest kid in the room, right? I'm going to need one of our children to come up and help me. Um, yeah, Savannah, you, you can come on up. She came all prepared, I think, to be an assistant today. She didn't even know I was doing this, and she was all prepared. Doesn't she look good? And she was, she was making donuts disappear for me earlier. <laughs> she, was, she had two ways of doing it. She could make it disappear with her cape, and then she could eat them and make them disappear. So how many donuts did you make disappear this morning? You only ate one? That's pretty good. You're usually like a two-donut person. But I, I brought some rings with me, some little feathered rings, and we're going to just start out with these. I want you to put your arm out. We're going to put that on your arm. So one. And this one here will go on your other arm. And this will go on your other arm. You don't have three arms? Maybe I got the wrong assistant. Where are we going to put this one? Oh. Put that one on your head, okay? And I've got some pieces of cloth. These are different colors. I've got one red, one blue, and one yellow. And I want you to pick one of those colors to start with. You want the blue? The blue one. That's going to represent God, the Holy Spirit, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take one of your rings and put it back into the bag. Which one do you want to put back in? That one? That one. Right there. And then we're going to put... Pull that through, part of the way. Now wiggle your fingers over the top and say, God, the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. And we'll see if anything happens. So we'll... ah. Whoa, look at that. That's cool. So now which color do you want to use? The red one. This is going to represent Jesus, God, the Son. So we need another ring. What ring do you have? So we put that in there. Push it down in. Okay, and where does this go? You're paying attention. Good. And then you wiggle your fingers over and say, Jesus loves you. And what do you think happened to the ring? It turned red. You think, oh, maybe it did. Look at that. So that goes on your arm. Okay, so we have one color left. Yellow. Yellow. We need to put that ring in the bag. Okay, push it in, down in their bag, there you go, and then this goes, got to help out, there you go, and that's going to be God the Father. So we have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. So wiggle your fingers over and say God the Father. God the Father. And then you want to reach in the bag and pull out the ring. Oh, look at that. Very good. Now there's only one thing, we've got three rings, don't we? But we don't believe in three gods, do we? No, we believe in one God who's revealed himself to us in three persons. So we're going to put those back into the bag, and we're going to turn them back into one color, okay? So represent one God. So we'll make them white again. Does that sound good? You know how you do that? You have to put all the colors together, put them through the middle of the bag, pull it through, wiggle your fingers over the top, say, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now guess what? They're all one color again. Uh-oh, that's not good. They're supposed to be back. Wait, wait a second. Well, they're not one color, but they're one ring. Good job. Give her a big hand. You did good. Thank you. She did a good job. All right, if we could turn some lights down a little and we'll be able to see the PowerPoint better. My message this morning is, are you inviting the devil to dinner? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> We're going to find out. Are you inviting the devil to dinner? What does that mean? Well, if you're inviting the devil to dinner, what are you going to feed him? You know, I don't know. I've never had him over for dinner, but maybe, maybe deviled eggs. He might like deviled eggs. Maybe a little deviled ham. Mm, that might be good. And for dessert, what will we give him for dessert? 
Maybe a little devil food cake, huh? Well, I'm not sure if that's what the devil eats, but we're going to find out what he eats this morning, and we're going to find out if we're feeding him, which is not a real good idea. <laughs> so let's take a look in Scripture. In Genesis 3, chapter 3, four, verse 14 and 15, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This uh, verse, verse 15, is known as the Proto-Evangelum, the first gospel in the Bible. It tells us that Jesus is going to stomp out the devil for us. And this is a prophecy of what was to come later. But it also tells us in the curse that he's cursed to eat dust. Well, I don't know how snakes eat dust. I've heard a lot of people come up with different ideas of what that means. They say, well, you know, because snakes crawl, you know, so low on the ground that, that they, they're always ingesting dust. Some people say they eat little rocks. All this stuff I've heard. But none of it made any sense to me. Because snakes don't eat dust. We live in snake country. How many see snakes on a regular basis? I've never seen one eating the dirt. I've seen them sitting in the entrance of my barn and, and being real annoying. When you get a rattlesnake like that, we give them what we call the John the Baptist treatment. And remove their head and bury them. <laughs> you know, and I hate to do that, but how many know rattlesnakes, once they decide where they want to be, they don't move. They look at you and they say, you move. I found one one time in a bathroom in our apartment. We have a little bathroom in our barn in the apartment. There's this little rattlesnake in there. It's like, what are you doing in here? You know, I had to give him the treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, last year, we didn't have any rattlesnakes. We used to get about six a year on our property, but never seen any of them eating the dirt. Well, there were a lot of commentators looked at this in different ways, and they have all these... Explanations. None of them really made real good sense to me, but I was taught when I went to Bible college, my Old Testament teacher told us that if, if Scripture doesn't make sense, just keep studying because the Bible always interprets itself. The Bible will tell you what it means. You just have to study a little bit. Sometimes that takes a little work, so we'll, we'll read a little bit more. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. To Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat it all the days of your you shall eat all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Well, here comes that dust. What, is, what does it say here? Who's the dust? We are the dust. Well, if that was the only place in Scripture that got that, I might say, well, I don't know if that fits, but let's look at some other Scriptures. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man to the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We were created out of dust. Genesis 18.27 says, Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. So even Abraham is referring to himself as dust and ashes. Psalm 103.14 says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are what? We are dust. So what I'm going to challenge you today is I think the devil is looking after us for a meal. We are the dust. Is there any scripture that, that confirms that? <coughs> 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, doing what? Seeking whom he may devour. The Bible's telling us he's going around, he wants to devour us. That's what the devil wants for dinner. He wants us. It's a spiritual meal. But before we get too freaked out about the devil being a lion and being scary, what does it say? Does it say he's a lion? No, it says he goes about like a lion. He's not a lion. The true lion, we find out who that is, is in Revelations 5.5. 5. It says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Jesus is the true lion, Amen. not the devil. So we know that 
he's the one in charge. And this is an interesting image here. There's an artist, I don't know how many saw, there was a show on the History Channel called The Real Face of Jesus. Anybody see that, that documentary? Really well done. Where this Christian man who's also an artist, computer artist, an artist, went to the Shroud of Turin and he took the image and, re and by studying it, realized it had three-dimensional properties to it and they, he took it and through com computer programs they came up with what the actual person's image on that shroud would have looked like in life and this is what he came up with. And many believe that that is the, the real image of Jesus and maybe what he looked like if we were to meet him today. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, now a lot of people probably remember when they did the study on the Shroud of Turin about 10 years ago, they came out and said, no, it couldn't possibly be the real image of Jesus because they carbon dated it and it wasn't 10,000, you know, it wasn't 2,000 years old. It only dated back to the Middle Ages. But what they didn't tell you is before they took the sample to date it, they had some men came in, stopped their study, studied the, the shroud, and told them where they could take the sample. The sample was taken from a corner where the nuns had repaired it and put new cloth on it. And so the cloth that they tested wasn't the original cloth. And not only that, that the laboratory that disproved it got a huge financial grant for disproving the shroud as being the real image of Jesus. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. For some reason, they don't want us to believe that that could possibly be the real image. Well, we do know for sure it is the image of a crucified man. And we don't know how the image got on the cloth. We don't know much you know, other than that, but quite possibly could be the real image of Jesus. And not only that, but after that study, they went in and decided to clean the shroud with a real high-powered vacuum. They removed any evidence that could be used to, to further date it. You know, you wonder why they did all that, but they don't want us to know. So what about Satan? Satan and demons are like flies. They feed off the garbage of our lives. Um, one of the names of Satan is Beelzebub, which is Ar Aramaic for Lord of the Flies. Nice name, huh? How'd you like to be the Lord of the Flies? In Greek, it's, you find also in the New Testament, Beelzebul, which means dung god. He's the god over dung. <laughs> and we have horses, so I'm real familiar with dung. <laughs> I have to clean at least a you know, full wheelbarrow out of the pasture every day to keep it clean. And why do we do that? Because we want the flies to come around. Well, demons are just like flies. They come around the garbage of your life. If there's a lot of garbage in your life, you're going to attract a lot of flies, right? If there's spiritual garbage in your life, you're going to attract a lot of things you don't want. So we feed and empower Satan with our sin. That's what we're feeding him with. We're giving him spiritual food. We're empowering him when we sin. Repeated habitual sin leads to bondage in our lives. That's why we need to get control of the sin in our life. If we continue to repeat a sin over and over again, eventually it will produce a bondage in our life. And yes, Christians can be in bondage. You cannot be demonically possessed, but you can be in bondage to sin. There is a difference there. We don't want to place ourselves in bondage. We know like the children of Israel, they were the, children, they were the chosen people of God. They were taken into captivity, into bondage. They didn't stop being the children of God, His chosen people. But they were there for a reason because they had sinned against God. See, we can put ourselves into bondage and sin and we don't want to do that. But our world has made sin a disease or a form of mental illness. A lot of things like alcoholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, uncontrollable rage syndrome. You hear all these things now are really just names for sin. Alcoholism doesn't start. You don't start out as an alcoholic. It starts with the sin of drunkenness. And then eventually as you do that more and more, it becomes a bondage in your life. It becomes an addiction. But it doesn't start that way. It starts out as sin. The Bible says to be drunk is a sin. Um, drug addiction in the same way. It starts out not as an as a, as a, uh, addiction or a disease. It starts out by you committing a sin. By doing something that God says you shouldn't do. And eventually it becomes an addiction. Now they say sex is an addiction. Somebody that's going out and having affairs on their wife and can't stop. Oh, that's okay. They just have a sex addiction. They just need some counseling. It started out as a sin. It, it's not a syndrome. That's what our world does. We like to take sin and we want to rename it. So that you're no longer responsible for your action. 
you know, it, it, and you'll see more and more of these syndromes and things are being named and coming up and, you know, they just are taking sin out of the world and, and making it something that you're no longer in control of so you can't be blamed for it. There can't be any accountability for it. And um, a couple of weeks ago, even with my mom, my, my wife and her kind of got into it about this issue because my mom was saying there were certain sins and lifestyles. She said, well, God wouldn't punish them for doing that because they're born that way or it's an addiction. And we're going, no, mom, it's a sin. It started out as sin. They weren't born that way. Read the Bible. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? You know, we had the pointer and pointer to Scripture. Because God wouldn't condemn it in the Bible if it was something you were born with or couldn't have any control over. You know, and that part of what I agreed with. But I go, Mom, I agree with you. God wouldn't condemn somebody for something they had no control over. But the Bible says they do have control over it. You know, so we have to get away from this taking the blame off of sin, especially in our own lives. Remember, this is about looking inwards and looking at us. What are we doing that could cause a bondage in our life? We need to get control over the sin in our own lives. All sin starts with temptation. You know, Satan makes sin look appealing. Nobody would do it if it wasn't appealing. You know? And it says, no wonder, in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He doesn't show up with, a horn, with horns and a pitchfork. He makes things look appealing to you. Look at advertising today. It makes sin look very appealing. Most of our advertising on TV, they use sin to get you to buy things. They use lust. They use sex to get you to buy things. You know, and, and anymore, I can't, I can't even watch most network TV. You know, I, I like watching the Home and Garden Channel, I watch the, and even on the History Channel. Some of those are not putting commercials on where I have to, you know, turn away or walk out of the room. I'm getting tired of it. I don't need that to buy a product. But they think the world does. They think you're going to buy that product if they make it look like this very attractive woman or very attractive man is going to like you but more if you buy that product. Well, you know, that's how Satan makes, he's an angel of light. He makes it look appealing or you wouldn't do it. Nobody goes out to be an alcoholic or a drug, drug addict just because, you know, they thought, well, you know, I want to do something interesting with my life. No, it's appealing. You go out, you party, you have fun. It's fun. There is pleasure in sin for a season. And then all the problems come. It never starts out with problems. It starts out with pleasure. Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Some of us, that's our problem. We enjoy the pleasures of a sin and it's good for a season. But then the season changes and we find ourselves in all kinds of trouble. We're going, how did I get here? Well, you got to go back to where you started. And then it's a long process getting out of it. But you know what? God is there to help us. And he gives us tools. God always provides for us a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God always gives us a way out. The problem is we don't always look for the way out. That's where the problem is. Anytime you're in deep temptation to do something, you know it's wrong, you got to look for the escape route. It's there. God provides it or his word's not true. And I know God's word is true. So there's always an escape. We have to look for the escape, not look for the excuse to avoid the escape. And God has given us tools to fight Satan. It says we must resist the devil. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So why does that work? See, if we don't feed him, he'll go look for a meal somewhere else. Like this poor lion here that looks like he needs a meal. <laughs> That's how we want Satan to look. We don't want to be feeding him. We don't want to be energizing. We don't, you know, he's going to go look for a meal somewhere else if you don't feed him. How many have ever had a stray animal show up on your, on your property or your house? And if you feed it, what happens? They stick around. <laughs> you feel so bad for them, you know, you just want to feed them. But that's not always the right thing to do. I remember when we first moved on our property, we have um, some red-tailed hawks that live in the trees nearby us. Well, every year when they 
after their young get pushed out of the nest, we hear them flying around, they're just crying constantly because the parents stopped feeding them. And my wife was going, shouldn't we throw some, maybe some raw chicken or something out for them? I feel so bad. I said, no, they've, they've done this for thousands of years and it's worked just fine. <laughs> if you feed them, not only will they then stick around, but they're not going to learn how to go fend for themselves. You know, it's that way with, with any kind of animal. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Don't feed them. And, and they won't stick around. They'll go somewhere else. Same with the devil. If we don't feed him with our sin, he's going to go look for a meal somewhere else. So let's not be his meal. Another weapon we have is prayer. Prayer is our spiritual fly swatter. Matthew 6, 19-13 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come, thy will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. See, this was a model prayer that Jesus gave us. It doesn't mean we have to say this prayer repeatedly, but it's, it's a model prayer. There are different steps in this prayer. We praise God. We ask for, what we, for our needs. But he also says in part of that model prayer, pray that you will not be tempted, that you'll be delivered from the evil one. We need to remember to pray for that each day. When we get up, on the way to work, whatever we're doing, pray, God, deliver me from evil today. Deliver me from temptation. You know, swat those flies away with prayer. And then we need to get out the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Sometimes we forget to use the Word of God. That's one of the most important tools we have. Right here. And Jesus gave us an example when he was tempted. Oh, and my... Devil finally went down. I was going to beat the devil up for you. <laughs> I'm not going to let him get away with this today. If you don't mind, somehow the plug, you know, how, how does a plug come out on its own? I'm telling you, the devil's fighting us this morning. He's not going to get away with it. I'll just blow air back <laughs> into him. I mean, this is just really weird. This has been inflated all through service, and somehow that just popped out on its own. It didn't happen on its own. This is a good illustration. <laughs> so he's going to play the part of the devil here. This is my punching bag. And we'll see how D Jesus dealt with the devil. It says Luke 4, 1 through 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, Now he says, What? It is written. He says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And he smacked him with the word of God. And we need to learn to do that once in a while. Oh, he popped back up. It says, then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. For what? It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He smacked him again with the word of God. Oh, come on, you can come up for more. <laughs> yeah, this, this verse reminds me of a story I heard about a minister whose wife loved to go shopping, and she would buy a new dress every week for church. Well, things got a little tight, and, and the pastor asked his wife, said, you know, I need you not to buy so many new dresses. We need to save some money. He said, so you need to remember when you go out shopping, what I, what I always tell you, that if you're tempted to buy something, just say, Satan, get thee behind me and resist that temptation and don't buy a new dress. Well, she went out shopping. 
And she was looking. She just said, I'll just go out and look. Well, sure enough, Sunday morning, she's got a brand new dress on again. Pastor says, well, I, I told you not to buy a new dress this week. We don't have the money. And she says, well, I, I tried it on and it looked real nice and I was tempted to get it. And I said, Satan, get thee behind me. And he said, it looks good from back here, too. <laughs> so she said, I had to buy it. So, but we need, to, <laughs> we need to remember the word of God and smack the devil. Anyway, Luke 4, 9 through 13. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for here. Now notice what the devil does this time. What does he do? He says, For it is written. Ah, he's trying to use the word of God. He says, He sh shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Then Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And one final smack, and he was down for the count. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Go back and look over how the devil tempts us. At the bottom of the first temptation, what did he do? It was the lust of the flesh. He always uses three different types of temptation. He knew that Jesus was hungry. He had been fasting for 40 days. How many have ever been on a 40-day fast? few of you have. I know my wife did it. I've not done a 40-day fast. Um, I've done a week, and I know after a week, I would like to turn stones into bread. <laughs> you know, 40 days. That was quite a temptation. Jesus was hungry. Remember, he was fully man. Not only was the Son of God, but when he was on earth, he was fully man. He was hungry. So the devil tempts him with, with the lust of the flesh, but Jesus resisted that by quoting scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. The second was the lust of the eyes. It says, what did he do? He showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. That's the important part. You see, he showed him, put it before him, the lust of the eyes. He saw all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, some people say, well, how can the devil show Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth? Isn't he the king of kings? Well, remember, at this time, Satan rules all the kingdoms of the earth. They are his. He did not lose control over them until after the crucifixion. Right at this point, they belong to him. He could have given them to Jesus. He's showing him the lust of the eyes. That all this can be yours if you'll just bow down to me. And then the last temptation was pride. He always likes to try to appeal to our pride. He said, yeah, if you just throw yourself down, the angels will gather you up and they'll save you. They'll keep your from striking your feet against the ground. You know, he's kind of tempting him to show that he really is the Son of God, trying to appeal to his pride. But Jesus didn't give in to that temptation either. See, it's the same with all of us. We're going to have all those temptations. You know, we're going to see something and it's going to appeal to our flesh. And we'll go, man, I just want that. I just got to have it. God's saying, no, that's not good for you. But it looks so good. And that's what I was talking about, all the advertising that we see and stuff. It's, it's the lust of the flesh. Appeals to our flesh. It's also the lust of the eyes. You know, it's showing us things that we don't need, but makes us think that we need them. And we're bombarded with it constantly. But our escape is the Word of God. We need to be people of God's Word. We need to study our Bibles. We need to be in prayer. That's our other weapon. And when we are in prayer, daily, and we're studied up in God's Word, the devil really can't do a whole lot because we're ready to smack him over the head. And it's kind of fun smacking the old devil down. But think of that spiritually, that's what you're doing. And he's going to flee. So let's not feed the devil. Let's not invite him to dinner. Let's resist him and let him flee. I want to close just in a, in a word of prayer and then I'll give a quick announcement just about Friday night and what to expect. But let's bow our heads for just a moment. First of all, um, before I close, if there's anybody here this morning that's not invited Jesus into your life, you've not made Jesus your Savior, and you'd like to do that this morning, it would be wrong for me to move on without giving you that opportunity. So without anybody looking around, if there's anybody here this morning that wants to pray to invite Jesus into your life, just slip your hand up and let me know who you are. Now, if there's anybody here that's saying, you know what, I've accepted Jesus, but I'm struggling. 
and I need God's help. Would you pray for me that God will give me strength to resist the devil? I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Just slip your hand up quickly so I know who I'm including in prayer. You can put your hands back down. Heavenly Father, it took courage for these that raised their hands to, to raise them up. God, they're admitting to you that they are weak. And we're all weak, God. We need you. We need your strength. We need your power in our lives. And I pray, God, that you will show them the way of escape when temptation comes. Lord, shine your light upon it so they can't deny that it's there and they'll take that route. And God, I pray that you'll give them strength by your Holy Spirit to resist the devil. And God, if they have brought any bondages into their life, we come against that. We ask you break every bondage this morning, Lord. We just pray for these that are struggling, God. And I pray for everybody here. We're going to go through some kind of struggle this week. Every single one of us. The enemy doesn't give up. He's trying to tear us down. But we pray, Jesus, that you'll cover us, that you'll watch over us, and you'll be with us. We ask that, Jesus, in your precious and your wonderful name. Amen.